All right, guys, welcome back. It's me, Daniel, with VintageMagic.com, and happy holidays. Happy Thanksgiving for those of you guys in the U.S. Tomorrow's Thanksgiving, and I wanted to do a very important video. Uh, there's going to be a few videos of this, but I wanted to discuss what we would be changing uh, if we could, and also moving forward for 2023 for the Magic Anniversary of 30 years. So... As many of you guys have seen, the Magic 30 anniversary set has brought in a lot of negativity. And I don't really want to talk about the negativity. I want to talk about more solutions. This is going to be a solutions-based video about more about what I would do in terms of 2023 and how we could, some ideas, brainstorming of how we could celebrate it as a community rather than fighting over it and how Magic is going downhill, etc. Also, uh, the other video I want to do is also about the Magic Cons. So the Magic Festivals is now considered Magic Con, and there's four of those next year. And I want to talk more about what I would do to help celebrate, uh, to celebrate that in a better way, uh, specifically the history of Magic. But the, the, this video is going to be more about the cards itself. So the Magic 30th Anniversary set is basically a four-pack uh, box commemorative set you have four packs and you get a various uh opportunity to get pull a black lotus power nine dual ends and old frame and new frame cards the thing is the biggest problem with this set was the actual release the way it was released was just a video there was some uh you know advertisements stuff like that but it wasn't a way where collectors can really collectors and players you know specifically players in this case could embrace it because the price tag itself was $1,000 for four packs, uh, basically $250 a pa pack plus tax. And also LGS stores were only given, uh, I think, one or two boxes. I think you may have given four if you were a special larger store. But that's not very much, right? So let's talk about solutions. I'm going to talk about it from a perspective where uh, I was actually, uh, I, I don't know if you guys got emails about this, but... There's this thing called Insight Space where they want feedback from players and collectors, etc., of what's going on with Wizards and the products they're having. Uh, I feel like they should have done more of that with this product and listened to uh, the community itself. So I'm gonna think, you know, I, I, I'm gonna give them my feedback as if I could have been in that position. All right. So number one, the first thing that I thought about that they can do for 2023 is the current set was a commemorative set. It is, uh, it is a, a specialty luxury product focused on collectors. I understand that, but players and a lot of other community members don't understand that. So for 2023, why don't we do something special where every single box that makes sense, not secret layer, but like any of the, and I, I'm not familiar with every type of box now because there's so many, but draft boosters, set boosters, collector boosters, is that correct? Something like that. All, all the sets have the opportunity to pull an old frame or new frame commemorative serialized number, serialized number uh, set uh, for the, the same run that they already did. So let me be clear. The beta set that they have, all Wizards would have to do is a beta set of old frame and new frame. And they would serialize them and have specific numerical sets. Uh, I think what they should do is have a thousand sets as the new frame, let's say. Um, and then they can make even lower numbers up to, uh, I don't know, $4.99. And then they can have uh, ones that are up to 50 And then, of course, one of ones, of course. And then one of... One of ten, something like that. And these would be signified based off of foils or what Marvel Masterpiece 2016. I hope the guys at Wizards may be listening to this. In 2016, Marvel Masterpieces launched a commemorative set to relaunch Marvel Masterpieces with the original artist, Joe Jusco. And 1992 was the year that Marvel Masterpieces was uh, created. It was one, one of my favorite sets of all time. And they did lots of different parallels for all the cards. So they had like an orange border, I believe, for out of 99. Uh, purple was one, out of 199. 
Um, and then the red spectrum was the red, right? Uh, and then there's other parallels. So whatever Wizards decides to do for the old frame and the new frame, I would do that. And then I think even the one of ones should be special or one of tens, whatever, should have foil. Because foil was not introduced in this Magic 30th Anniversary set. So I think that would look really snazzy, really collectible. Obviously, the back of those cards would still be unplayable. It would be tournament, uh, not legal. But it would be very collectible. And the most important thing is every single, every single player, collector, whatever, investor, could buy those boxes and they could pr print as many as they want. And they would insert them. Also very important is to show, you know, the, the serial number part is very critical. I think if they did, uh, you know, like kind of, a, kind of a reprint set, kind of what they're doing now, without the serial number, I don't think that would work. Because the serial number is what holds value and also chasing and also produces this EV factor, I guess, for boxes. So great example is the Brothers War box. If you guys have checked it out they've done out of 500 serial number cards and there's cards on ebay that are like five thousand dollars buy it now and if you look at the soul listings over a couple thousand for playable cards like thornum amethyst and uh warm coral coal warm and coil engine and amber mox or you know there's different cards that are playables right so if you think about this if you think about what's going on imagine if you had a Sword of Fire and Ice or all those cards, right? Later on, they'll do that. Serial number cards. The values of those are going to be substantially more. Uh, some people have criticized the type of, you know, the, the, the black kind of, you know, uh, num numerical out of 500. You know, look, you could fight about that all you want. I think it looks pretty good, but, you know, you could jazz it up a little bit, make it a little bit more subtle. That's okay. I would look at the sports card world. You know, I'm giving feedback to Wizards here, right? Look at the sports card world. Look at how they do it, right? Look how beautiful it's done. So number two, number two, uh, sports cards. Let's talk about sports cards. Sports cards are based off historical uh, you know, her history, right? It's only value is really just history. Because think about it this way. They use patches, bats, whatever. But older cards like Mickey Mantle, Babe Ruth, all those guys, right? Michael Jordan, uh, you know, Wayne Gretzky. No one's really seen those guys play if you were born recently and stuff. Uh, even myself, I never got a chance to see Michael Jordan play. So what makes that so special? It's the history. Sports celebrates history. If you look at the era of years of uh, sports... The way they do it is all about the memories of that. So they go, you know, like Aaron Judge breaking Roger Maris' uh, 61 home run record for the American League. It's a huge deal. He's a Yankee, right? There's history. The ball itself, the guy turned down $3 million for, to sell the ball outright versus going to auction. Because there's a lot of history involved. And there are collectors that are willing to buy into history. Wizards should capitalize that and also give it an, uh, everybody an opportunity to own pieces of history. So I think that was, and I'll talk about that also the Magic 30 event and how they can improve that for the Magic Cons next year, the four of them, or maybe have a few more. I don't know. But the reality is I would do for number two, historically, is integrate cards and stuff for the history. So I propose uh, they do the buyback system where Marvel Masterpieces 2016 did, they bought back the 1992 Marvel Masterpiece set and they essentially stamped in foil, uh, whatever the you know stamp they had. You can put 30th anniversary, right? And have them serial numbered to make it even more special. You can have regular foil ones and you can have them stamped, you know, numbered. And basically what that is, it's saying these are uh, historical parallels. These were the, the air, this is what we started with the betas or the alphas, whatever direction you want to go, even unlimited. You could go unlimited also because unlimited was a part of that Power 9 era. Then integrate, you know, Power 9, dual lands, etc. And again, do parallels throughout the year. Yes, that's going to be some hard cost to Wizards because they're not printing them. And I doubt that they have troves of that laying around. Hopefully not. But that is history. Another thing they can do is integrate redemption cards. I've been saying this in my other videos for like, have you... 
Go back five years ago. I've said this before and I'll say it again. They should have redemption cards, especially for 2023, of ways to get Beta, Legends, Arabian Nights. If they have Alpha Packs, so be it. Unlimited, uh, Starter Decks, whatever. Congratulations! You have one, uh, you, have, uh, you have in your hand a redemption card that you can get, receive an Arabian Nights Booster Pack, a Beta Booster Pack, a Beta Starter Deck. And you have, and, and that is only good for 2023. So that will give you that revenue. Let's talk about the business. Revenue, the hype, the, the, the interest, and you print, print as much as you want. People will buy so many boxes of your collectible, your cards, not only to play the game, but also to own the piece of history throughout all of it. And I would not do it. I'm saying it. Do not do it just for collectors, but do it for all the players. So everybody has a chance an opportunity to do it. Now, you're probably saying, well, that makes no sense because in the collector stuff, uh, we usually have a higher MSRP, so what's going to make them more special? Well, I could say this. You could easily put historical items that are only specialty towards the collector boxes. That's that's fine. But also still have something to chase that's you know standard for the draft boxes, right? Just any player itself. You could argue and say, well, players don't really care about that stuff, Dan. Uh, the BF, they totally do, right? The, 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 the crap they don't, they do. See, the thing is this. We all get older and we all grow up. That's one thing that's guaranteed. And one thing that Magic has brought is memories and just this great fandom, right? We all care about the history. Why would you care? Why would you print this Black Lotus thing and do all this commemorative products, right? Because of the history. It means a lot to us. So one thing, number three, I'm going to touch here is more of a philosophical part and very important is magic is going to die if we do not actually grow the game, uh, not just from Magic Arena, but from a paper game perspective. If we don't grow the memories, the history, the events, the competition, right, the Pro Tour, all that stuff that was the World Championships that existed before on a larger scale, if we don't continue to develop that, then we will lose uh, players, which we've already seen. Hasbro has seen that, right? The stock has gone down. We all feel that. Um, and it will eventually, long-term, affect the growth of Magic and also the development of the game, and then, in short, the, the profits and et cetera. Now, let's talk about what I just mentioned there, number four, was if we do not actually grow the player base from a competitive standpoint. This is important. In the past, we, well, now we have like Magic Champions, like Magic Arena, and stuff like that, right? But the Pro Tour and everything was I felt was more vibrant back in the day, the Grand Prix system. Now you have a system where there's only four Magic Cons and you have all these qualifiers online, etc. Maybe you have your LGS stores. I think it, it's time for Wizards to get the LGS stores back involved, provide better price support, and really, I'm, on, I'm doing a video, Nick. Okay, please, I'm on the video. Um, give them better price support and be more of a partner because the challenge we're having here is that it starts at the beginning. Magic started by having incredible, an incredible like LGS presence, right? Where uh, you could walk into a game store, learn how to play Magic, and it was very welcoming, and other games, collectibles, whatever, right, comics, and you're able to really immerse yourself in the community, and that's the problem right now. Obviously, COVID kind of hit everything in a weird way. I don't think Magic Arena is a bad thing. I think Magic Arena is a great thing. You could argue, well, well that's more profitable, sure, but the LGS store format, people always want to play in person. That comes to uh, the example of poker, for example. Poker, I would rather play in person at poker and and learn learn how to play poker, you know, play with my friends, etc. in person. Yeah, you can play it online or do online video game, you know, stuff, but in the end, uh, poker is incredible, uh, incredible game in person. Just like any other game that you can ever imagine. So I really feel like Magic, Hasbro, Wizards needs to get back into that 
uh, scene. And why not for Magic 30, for 30th anniversary, why not uh, kind of revitalize that original, how it started, how, how you know, the story was uh, Peter Atkinson and their team went across the West Coast and everywhere Midwest and showed people how to play Magic. And it was just like, hey, I have a brand new game. Go to local game stores. This is how you play. I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm saying re-partner with the LGS stores. Why not give them these uh, prize support Magic 30th products so they can, you know, get people in the doors and let's bring back this, uh, you know, this kind of community. Um, also, you know, why not get back and have the revitalized the, the, the Grand Prix system or the whatever way. I'm not a, a professional gamer, but they need to talk to professional gamers on how would they, the tournament players, how do we get back into that to grow that player base once again? Because if you don't do that, you're going to end up losing more players, which in turn loses value for the collectibles and the stuff you're selling, and no one's going to care. And then Magic will ultimately fail. See, the saying goes, short-term gain, long-term pain. And that's exactly what has happened with the situation with Wizards. So we need to rectify that by giving back to that community and growing it back and making it an actual initiative. Um, I know they have like a podcast or something with a bunch of higher-ups from Wizards and people like Gavin Verhey, I think Mark Rosewater, etc. And I think that that was just a micro little community, you know, these are ideas. But I really feel like if you're really going to listen to everybody, you got to listen, listen to people that also have collected and invested into magic because that's an important part of the community. So I, I, I want to hit home one thing. A lot of people feel that investors and collectors really F up the market and really screwed up for players. And I, I'll be honest with you. One of, the, one of the problems we have here is that magic is a game first and foremost an awesome game, one of the best games ever created, if not the best. But we have a community where there's also collectors and investors, and that has become a thing uh, over time. So how do you like have a world of both, right? How do you have a world of both collectors, investors, and players get involved? So you have to offer products and uh, different experiences. So another thing I thought about was the artists. So I'm an art collector, as you guys know. And uh, I don't know if you guys knew this, I sold the Black Lotus original artwork for $4 million uh, and I delivered it at Magic 30 in Las Vegas. Well, what was interesting about it was no one really knew about it. Partly it's because I tried to talk about it with some people at Wizards or people that knew people at Wizards, but no one wanted to get involved with the secondary market. Well, it's not really about the sale. It's about why not have the opportunity for people to look at this amazing piece of history, or to see other pieces of works, etc. So why not for 2023, why not Wizards introduce what Marvel has done really well, the Marvel sketch cards, where you have various artists of, you know, you have tons of artists in Magic, and have them draw and sketch different creations where they would maybe be, you know, you could get one, one a box. So in uh, Marvel Masterpieces, you essentially get one sketch card per box. Great idea. You're guaranteed that parallel every single time. Uh, you could also inclu include artist proofs, limited edition ones. You can do uh, other experiences where maybe you have, uh, you could create a magic card with an artist. Not just have Post Malone. I know Post Malone is famous for the love of God. He's a, he seems like a nice guy, but why not have the community members have an opportunity to create something with uh, the artist? And there's another point. I don't know what point we're at, five, six, whatever. Why not have experiences with Mark Rosewater or, or Gavin Verhey? Have designed your own magic card. Win that with, you know, purchasing our product as a thank you, as an experience item. These are all simple things. Come to Wizards of the Coast for a week, whatever, right? These are lots of things you could do. So I really think these are like opportunities we can change for 2023. Sorry guys, uh, I'm building a pool, so there's a lot of noise in the background. All right. So lastly, I wanna talk about the execution. The execution of releasing uh, this type of information. 
I think it's really important that it's not just a video and uh, two people were talking. I think one of them was uh, an old player, uh, Brian Kibler or something. I, I don't think that's enough. I think we need to do uh, a better job of really just, just showcasing this as this is the history of where we've gone. The video should not talk about the new product. It should talk more about where we began, how it's evolved, and that how it's going to be now, and how they're all together. And that is something that I really feel, you know, like the theme of this video is that Wizards totally missed, but has a tremendous opportunity. Because we're actually not in the Technic 30 year, right? So 1993 was when Magic started. 2023 will be the official full year. So Wizards, if you are listening, I'm I'm free. I don't do I don't do much these days. I sell some cards here and there. I will donate my time for the community for free. I don't need to get paid nothing. I just hope someone out there listens and gives me a call. Vintagemagic.com. My phone number is down below, and I will be glad to talk more about these ideas. And you know, I live in Seattle also. I live in Hawaii and I live in Seattle. So why not, you know, why don't we have lunch? Whoever's out there, whoever's listening to this, I hope someone listens. All right, guys, I hope you guys enjoy the video. I want to hear your comments also below. I'm also going to do a video about the Magic 30 event and solutions of what the Magic Cons, the four Magic Cons, one of them is in Europe and one of them is in Vegas also. Uh, first one's in Philly in February and then May and Minneapolis. So I'll do a video about that. But again, thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And those of you out there at Wizards, if you're listening, please give me a call. I'm happy to help. All right, guys. Take care. Hey everyone, it's me, Daniel, with VintageMagic.com. I want to share with you more about how we handle consignments. So to begin the consignment process, we actually need to start with the consultation service. In this consultation, I will determine what you're looking to do. And generally, consigners usually tell me, hey Dan, I'm looking to sell my items and maximize the value of their collection. After we determine through the consultation, I usually like to do an appraisal process. And in the appraisal process, in terms of a consignment, is more fitted towards authenticity and valuation for current market values. From there, after a contract is crafted and signed, we will then receive the items from you. The reason why our consignment process is very thorough is we also identify cards that could be graded so then they can maximize higher dollar values. So the payment process is very simple. Once we have sold your items, you'll get an updated ledger and we will process payment um, for whatever form of payment you need. As a consigner, you're gonna experience our white glove service. What that means is I'm gonna personally handle your collectibles from beginning to end. And rest assured, the client that purchases your collectibles will also receive the same white glove service. It's a signature service that I really pride myself on in working closely with my clients. Vintage Magic. Game. Collect. Invest. For more information about our consulting and professional services, visit VintageMagic.com.